Well, apart from constantly being surrounded by a celebrity in Andy Steiger, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's like a B-list celebrity, but I have, I have had quite, what? what you, B+. Plus. We'll give it to him. Uh, yeah, one book, dude. <laughs> I have been, uh, I have been, Ooh. oh, okay. Anyways, Andy's written a book, ladies and gentlemen, it's called Thinking. If you've never read it, it's a good one, apparently. So as I was saying, I have had a brush with greatness many, many times in my life. And I, I don't know why this happens to me, but like, it just seems I constantly have celebrities that show up in my path. And whatnot, and so I thought I'd let you know about some of them. The first one that I've literally seen three times in like the last two years is Lights. Some of you might know who Lights is. Still haven't seen her. Look at that. So I have uh, one time I'm in H and M minding my own business, and I've always said to myself too, like if I see a celebrity, I'm gonna play it cool, right? I'm I'm cool. And so they're just a normal person, right? So I saw vaguely, I, I had no really idea who Lights was. Didn't matter to me. I, I can't name one song. But I was with one of my buddies. He was like, dude, she is amazing. I'm such a big fan. And so he was losing his mind. And I'm like, well, just don't go, like, go, go say hi, but don't say anything dumb, right? And so he just said, like, shopping with the kids. You know, played, he played it cool, right? So saw Lights like three times, once at Ikea as well, and one time uh, in the getting my driver's license renewed. She was sitting there, you know, like normal people do, right? So I saw lights. Then another time, um, I was in, about two years ago, I was in New York for a day with some friends. We were staying in D.C., Washington, D.C., and we said, oh, let's drive all the way up to New York to see the city. I'm there for five hours, and in the five hours, I see a celebrity. I see this guy from the show Monk. And so, again, it wasn't a show that I watched, but the girl we were with, she's like, hey, uh, that's that's the guy from the show my parents watch. And we're all, oh, so we're, we're enjoying that. And we like, we pretended to take the, uh, like the selfie pic, but we're actually like aiming it backwards to uh, make sure we got Monk. So then I'm walking around in Vancouver with my family, minding my own business. And as I'm walking, I'm walking with my mom. She's walking next to me. And I point up and I'm like, mom, that is, uh, that's Larry Mullen Jr., and she's like, what? I'm like, that's the drummer from U2. And, and he was like moving like this. And he just walked by. He had the sunglasses on. That's him right there. And so he walked right by. And she's like, no, like, damn, we have to go get a photo. We got to do something. I'm like, mom, play it cool. <laughs> we got to play it cool. And so I'm like, just enjoy that moment and whatnot. And so my dad and I were uh, going to do a second trip to New York because he had never been. I'm like, let's do a New York trip. We did a baseball trip, saw the East Coast. And I'm like, I wonder if I will see any celebrities. And so within 10 minutes, okay, I'm there for 10 minutes, and I'm on this dock. We're actually in Brooklyn, and within 10 minutes, this guy walks by me with his family, and I, I look up at his face. It was Ethan Hawke, an actor. He's like an A-minus actor, okay? A-list, B-plus, Andy, he's kind of like you. Yeah. So I saw Ethan Hawke. I'm like, wow, just, I see them everywhere. But I played it cool. Do you know what I'm saying? So then I uh, continue making my journey. We, uh, it was a couple days later. It was a Saturday, and my dad's like, hey, I want to go do some reading. I'm like, great. I'm going to go walk around in the Soho district, which is kind of like the fancy shopping district, see what I see. And as I'm making my way down this, you know, it's like a rainy day, and I have my rain jacket on, and making my way uh, down the street, I go into one particular store. And as I look outside the store, I see two massive black SUVs parked there. And I'm thinking, Trump. that's actually what I did think first. I thought Trump. But then I was like, no, he doesn't really shop at this store. So I go, down, I go down the escalator, and as I'm going down the escalator, just I'm like, I'm curious, you know, uh, there's a girl at the bottom talking to her manager. And she's like, oh, I, like, I looked in his face, and I looked in his face, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't stop. And the manager's like, okay, you need to cool it. You need to cool it, okay? Play it cool. And so I, I, I kind of overhear this conversation. I go down, and then I pretend to, like, look at shirts. And I'm like looking around and make my way back to this girl. And I come to her and I say, hey, so like, do celebrities come shop here at all? Like, do, do you ever see famous people? Like, what's the deal with these SUVs? And she looks at me and she's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I'm, I'm seriously, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> you were just screaming about it, but fine, I'll play it cool. So I'm minding my own business and I keep walking through the store. And next thing I see, is I see this guy going, He's kind of standing there like this. He's kind of like, it seemed like he was drawing attention to himself. I look over, I'm like, 
oh, I saw him yesterday. That was the, that's a pastor from New York City, the Hillsong Church. I'm like, that's Carl Lentz. I'm like, okay, he's not really that big of a celebrity. I didn't know pastors got the black SUVs now. But I'm like, that's cool. You know, so I'm like, no big deal. I'll play it cool. And I keep walking and I make my way over to the, uh, to pretend to look at suits, whatever. I'm standing there and I see, I notice that him and he's got this entourage with him. And they're making their way out and, uh, and they go up the escalator. And I, I kind of like turn away from the suit, start looking at the entourage and whatnot. And I see there's one guy, a particular guy, putting like a shirt on and stuff like that. He's putting on a hoodie. And I could see as he put his hoodie on, there's a big tattoo on his neck. And he turned around and he looked at me. And it was Justin Bieber. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, standing there like... <laughs> But I got to play it cool, friends. And so I'm standing there, and he looks at me, and I kind of look at him, and I give him one of these. <laughs> you know? And I think he knew, like, we're both Canadian and, and whatnot. And so, but to prove it, like, there, because all these people were like, oh, you never saw him, you never saw him. But then I'm like, yeah, look, like, these, this is the photo, this one here, was when they were both together shopping that day in New York City. And so that's Carl's wife. But that's literally what he's wearing with the army pants. And so that is how I've seen all these celebrities. You say, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Let's pray. Message, it's a good sermon. It's powerful, powerful, life-changing. So you guys are all sitting here thinking, Daniel, why are you telling this to me? Why, what does this, why does this matter? And the reason I tell you this is there's a very significant difference from when you see and hear about someone, but maybe only in pictures, or you maybe only hear about them in, you know, you listen to Justin Bieber's song, you hear about him, whatever, on the news, on the, on the radio, on the, on the YouTubes. But then, when you see them in real life, it's a profound difference, and you realize that actually they're a physical pe- person. They're a physical person, they exist, and they're just like you and me. They're a man, they're a woman, a human being. It changes the way we see a person. And so as we study Colossians 1 today, I want to hopefully communicate to you the significance of the fact that Jesus became a human. I have two points here, okay? And it's this. Jesus' physical life is greater than we know, and Jesus' physical death is far greater than we could ever imagine. Okay? And so as we walk through this text, I want us to be thinking these two things. Okay? Jesus' physical life is greater than we know, and his physical death is far greater than we could ever imagine. So here we go, point number one. Jesus, is his physical life is far greater than we know. Verse 15 of Colossians 1 reads this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's pray. It's a beautiful text. We could end it there. But I want to I open this up a bit because it is a, a profound statement about who Jesus is. Because what you have to understand is in the ancient world around the time where Paul is ministering, and he's, he's ministering right now, he's writing a letter to the church in Colossae, which he helped plant early on. He ministered to them, and since he's gone off, and he's trying to stay in communication. And one of the things that you see Paul doing a lot is he's writing letters to correct, try and recorrect theology that's going wrong, because he talks about false teachers that are coming in, and they're spreading different news and different tweaks to the gospel that actually aren't, aren't real. And so Paul's writing to address this. And he comes across something in the ancient world that is known as the Gnostic controversy. Okay? And the Gnostic controversy basically means this. There was something called cosmic cosmological dualism, meaning that a lot of people in the ancient world believed that the body was bad, the human flesh is bad, but but the mind is good, and our soul 
this knowledge that we have. And so our, our body is bad. That's what, that's what corrupts us. But our, our body, our mind, our mind is good. And so if we can figure out and purify, keep the mind pure and get rid of the body, then we're going to receive salvation through that. It's salvation through knowledge. And so there's a lot of debate on whether, how this was, was it full Gnosticism? Was it like a, a syncretist thing or they're mixing in some Judaism into it, people coming in? Uh, there's a big debate on that. But the, the thing I want to talk about is this Gnosticism because in this controversy, we see three verses here. I want to point out to you, Colossians 1, John 1, and Hebrews 1 that expel and get rid of this controversy to us, okay? So we're going to do like a little bit of a Bible study. Are you okay with that? Good. <laughs> So we see John 1. This is the first one I want to do. Okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So one of the ways I've heard this passage explained before is basically if you were to cycle through and you just put, instead of word, you just replace it with Jesus. And so you, you would kind of say, well, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. And these are all true statements. But I actually do think it's a little more deeper than that. What is being communicated here by John is, is done to actually completely erase this idea of Gnosticism. And so this word, when it says the word word, Basically, what that's communicating in the Greek, it says logos. In the beginning was the logos. Okay? And the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And what this word communicates, basically logos, what it means, it means wisdom, intelligence. In the beginning was this wisdom, and there was this intelligence. Okay? Now, this is where it breaks down and gets different. In all religions, outside of Christianity... The seeking this logos, this wisdom, this, this intelligence is the thing that, we, that they seek to attain, right? So, for example, Buddhism. They go their whole lives, and you reincarnate. But each time, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to do more. 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 Eventually, I will attain this wisdom that is now going to make me you know, cease to exist, Okay? And every other religion that you'll see is all about doing these things so that one day we will attain this, uh, this level of wisdom. And so if I was going to point this out, this is where it gets very, it comes in conflict, this, this John 1 passage with this Logos. Okay? Because if you see here, in verse 14, the word, the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. So what we see is we see in John 1, Logos, flesh. Can you read that? So that's what we see in John 1, that this, this Logos becomes flesh. And you say, well, what's the big deal behind that? Well, this is the big deal. As opposed to every other religion in the world where you're trying to attain this knowledge, attain, I'm trying to get better, 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 better. This wisdom becomes a person. This wisdom, this, this thing that we cannot approach, becomes a person. Someone you can know. For the disciples, someone they could hug, they could high five. You could go see him. You could talk to him. You could, you could have a relationship with him. This has never happened before. And this is something that's completely, it's, it's completely new. People don't quite understand it. And this is what John's saying. He says, no. This is the significance of this. This thing that was unattainable has now become flesh, and it's now become someone that we can know. But then you say, okay, but you know, we understand that this wisdom becomes a person. Okay, but it understand like, uh, yeah, I, I guess it takes it, it kills religion. Is that what you're saying? And you're saying, yeah, it kills religion, and it does one more. And in fact, it actually doesn't allow for any religions, is what he's saying. And so, if you follow along, you get to the author of Hebrews. That's what the author of Hebrews says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance 
of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So there's two things I want to point out to you. The first one is in the past. Okay, so what this is referring to is in the past where God revealed himself to his people before Jesus. And so you might remember stories, if you ever studied in, in uh, Sunday school and whatnot, right? When God brings the people out of Egypt, he, he comes to them as this cloud, right? And this thing that they can see. And at night, it's like a pillar of fire. And it's this hot pillar of fire, so hot that like, at one point when he, like Pharaoh's army comes to try and take the people of Egypt, this fire, like, they can't get to the people because the fire is in the way. And it's too hot and it's too great. There's other ways, too, that he's communicated to his people. He communicates to them uh, through dreams, through prophets. But if you notice, this is what he says. He says, this is in the past. These last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And by extension, what, what the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate to you is that this is the last word. Okay, that was the past. Now he's communicated to the son which is the fullest extent of that communication, okay? It's the son, the physical flesh human being, Jesus, okay? Are you with me still? You seeing how this plays out? He's a physical human being. Now, this is, again, clarified in Colossians, okay? So we have the idea that he is the image of the invisible God, Okay? And as you keep working through that Colossians verse, we see that the fullness dwells in God and that he made peace through his blood. Non-physical things don't bleed. Jesus is a physical human, and the author of Colossians, Paul, is careful to make sure that you know that. Okay, so we have fullness of God, and we have blood. That does not... Wow. So we have, these are, the, these are the things here. We see this. And this is, this, if you put these together, this basically dispels the Gnostic controversy. And so they're trying to do away with the, um, the fact that Jesus isn't a human being. Or that, yeah, that he's not just a spirit. He's a human being, okay? This is something important that you have to understand. And so I want to bring you back here then to this Hebrew thing where it's talking about the son. It's talking about uh, th- this final word, Okay. Tim Keller writes this. He says, Jesus Christ is the word of God because no more comprehensive, personal, and beautiful communication of God is possible. We cannot look directly at the sun with our eyes. The glory of it would immediately overwhelm and destroy our sight. We have to look at it through a filter. Then we can see the greatest flames and colors. When we look at Jesus Christ, he is shown to us in the scriptures. We're looking at the glory of God through the filter of a human nature. So I think this means two things. The first one is this. And as I mentioned before, he's the final word. He's the final word. That's it. There's not, there's not going to be another revelation that's going to come from you going off to this magical service where Spencer's special dream is going to give you a new revelation of God. Okay? It doesn't exist. Jesus is that final word. And so what he's, the author's trying to say is, if you're, going to, if you're going to step outside the bounds of that, you're no longer in Christianity. You're making stuff up. You're living in fairy tales. There's no exclusive word or access that this Spencer special dream can get you, okay? You either have the word of God, Jesus, is proclaimed in the Bible. You take that for what it is, and you seek to learn it and know it. I'm going to study it. And you can pray to him. You can know him. And he can reveal himself and reveal more about who he is to you. Or you can kind of say, no, nah, you know, I like that, but I want to have this God that... You know, you, you begin to slowly create in your own image. That's the, that's the first thing that we often do. The second thing is this. We can take um, this picture of Jesus as he's, as he's revealed in the scriptures, and we can say, yeah, I'm not following that one. We choose rebellion. And so this is, there's another layer to this uh, Hebrews passage I want to I point out to you in, in the sense that in the past, God, you know, he communicated through the prophets, and that's great. And that's a good thing, and he, and he chose to have it that way. But even back then, the people rebelled against the prophets. 
They, they didn't quite listen. Now you are faced with the actual person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of everything the prophets ever said, everything that was ever in a dream, everything that has existed and been known about God is now poured fully into the person of Jesus. And you have, you're basically forced with the decision, either I rebel against Jesus or I follow him. Like there's all the cards are on the table now. So like maybe like it's kind of bad that you rebelled against the prophets. Like it's really bad if you rebel against Jesus now because you, there's no extra stuff you can add to it. He's the fullness of God in one man. And that doesn't stick, that doesn't stick well with us as a culture because we're a culture of pluralism. And so we actually like to take lots of other religions and say they're all true. We like to say this one's true, this one's true, they're all good. Okay, maybe there's some of you in here who might even take pieces of other religions and say, this is my faith. And I believe, you know, that God is this. And what you've done is you've constructed a mantle and you've rejected the person of Jesus Christ as he's revealed in the scriptures, which now puts you at odds with him. You're now against him and he's against you. And there are consequences to this. Verse 20, though, it says this. It says that through him, though, through, through Jesus, he came in to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Okay, again, this physical idea, he, his blood he came to you. So imagine with me that we live in the Middle Ages, okay? And we all live under this certain king, okay? And we don't really like this king, and so we're going to move and we're going to go find a new king. We're going to find a new king. And, and the, uh, the emissaries of this former king come to you and say, hey, um, what are you doing? Why aren't you following uh, the true king anymore? And you'll say, well, uh, I don't really like him. You know, I'm just, he's not my deal. And you keep rejecting the emissary, and so they'll send another one. Hey, dude, you need to come back to our side. You know we're going to go to war, right? No, I don't think I want to. And you keep sending emissaries, emissaries, emissaries. Then eventually, the stakes get higher, because one declares war on the other. And now your army and your king gets ready, and this, this king, he's sending his prince with his army on his white horse, and they're coming for you. Okay, you know, oh man, there's gonna be this massive battle, massive battle, massive battle. Things are getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And you know that actually this army looks very menacing. I'm gonna be destroyed right now as we speak. And this prince makes his way through the battle, comes to you, and he dies for you. He says, I know you've rebelled against me, but I want you back with me. And so I'm gonna pay the punishment of your rebellion, and you come back with me to my kingdom where you truly belong. He dies for us. And this prince, he comes in love, not slaughter. Make no mistake, he will come again with wrath and with fury, but he comes to us now and he offers us now an invitation. He says, come know me. Come know this, this person of Jesus. Don't follow this religion. Don't follow this, this spirit thing that you might be able to grasp around and you can never quite attain. Follow me, come know me. He's coming to make peace, not war. And it leaves us with the question, are we going to follow or not? I have another point, and it's this. And it's tied into what I just said. Jesus' physical death is far greater than we could ever imagine. Verse 21 says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. You were once alienated, alienated, alienated. What does this mean? I think it means this. Tim Keller points out a great illustration. He says, imagine with me that the distance from the nearest, um, from the earth to the sun, okay, the earth to the sun, that distance is a sheet of paper. Okay, so earth to the sun. If you're going to try and get across our galaxy, it would be a stack of these papers 70 feet high. And if you were to try to cross across our galaxy, it would be a stack of papers 310 miles long. And this enormous galaxy that we, we have, that we exist in, that we think that we're so great in, right? This enormous galaxy is but a speck of dust in, a, in a, an infinite amount of galaxies. 
We don't even know how many are out there. And we are a speck of dust in this galaxy. And there is one by the name of Jesus who holds them all by the power of his word, by the power of his pinky. And you have the audacity to say, actually, I think you should be my secretary. Does that sound like the guy we should make our secretary? We are alienated from God. Jesus comes, the living word comes to us and offers us grace. And he offers us to come back. But our response is often lacking. And then we respond in a few different ways. The first way we respond is full rebellion. We say, screw Jesus. Screw Christianity. Screw religion, whatever. Uh, I'm going to go do whatever I want. And you run and you rebel. And, you know, we, we love to say, I always, I love hearing this all the time, right? You know, like, oh, the reason I rebel, though, is it's such a hard culture. You know, the culture is so hard. And we're sitting there, like, in our armchair critiquing culture all the time, right? Instead of engaging, trying to change culture, we sit there, oh, man, the culture is making me do all this sin. And so we, we rebel, though, because here's the thing, and this is what the Bible tells us, we actually love the sin. Ooh, don't we? Don't we love the taste of how it tastes in the moment? Oh, it tastes good, doesn't it? It tastes so good. Yeah, but it's rebellion. You know, oh, I'm going to be in trouble with God. Yeah, but it tastes so good. John 3.19, the one after the nice John 3.16 verse, says this. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Scripture says we love the dark. We love it. We love to sit inside of it. We like to be surrounded by it when no one's watching. Every one of us here, some of us who are probably calling ourselves Christians, on the front of it, when we go home and we love the dark. When we're alone, we love the dark. We don't care. We don't choose the light. That's the first way. The second way is this. We choose religion. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by religion? Well, we chase salvation. We chase heaven or whatever that means to you. And God happens to be the means by which we accomplish that. Oh, you mean I can get to heaven? I can be saved? Great. Okay, Christianity is the way to do it? Awesome. I'm going to follow that. And so what you do is you begin to do your best. I'm going to be the best Christian. I'm going to memorize verse after verse after verse. I'm going to show up to Bible study. I'm going to show up to church on the weekend. I'm going to do my worship thing because I'm earning this favor with God. It's going to be great. I'm going to be there in the end. And, and thank goodness, God, that you'd make this, this way for me. However, what we do when we do this, though, is we obey not because of God's greatness, but we obey because of what we want, right? So we're not coming to God saying, actually, God, you're the one worthy of praise, and I, and I, and I come to you, and I praise you. No, we're saying, that's great, God, but I need to get there, and you're just, you're just along the path. I'll play the game as it was. And the danger is, is that some of you guys in here probably are playing the game. Are you playing the game? Are you playing the religion game? Because let me tell you something. That's one of the most selfish things you could do. Your whole existence that you see yourself here is, I'm going to get myself forward. And I might push others aside to get there because I'm going to get God in the end. Is that you tonight? Is that you? And the crazy thing is this. I, I spent this, this time here trying to explain to you the fact that, you know, this, this God has become a human and, he, and he's offering a, a hand, a, hand like to a relationship. Just come, come be with me. Come know me. And what you basically do is you, he offers you the hand and you spit on his hand. And you say, no, I'm going to get my, myself there. That's what religion does. And it's disgusting. We think that in our own pride, we can be our own pseudo saviors through this religion. And we become the very thing that he came to seek to destroy. We, we become, we're going to say, that, yeah, he came to destroy religion, but I'm going to use this religion to get me ahead and become selfish. And we basically, yeah, we are spitting in his face. Every time that you do this, you are nailing him to the cross again for what?
There's a third way, though, that you need to understand. You can rebel. You can turn to trying to save yourself through religion. Or you can trust the gospel. Basically, while religion says, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this, and I'll get there in the end, the gospel says, you know what? I'm looking inwardly, and I've come to the realization that actually I can't do this. I'm not as good as I thought I was. And I need help. Do you need help in your life? Because you'll have it. Because he's reaching his hand out to you, and he's saying, trust in me, know me. And the people who do this, they accept the, the extending hand. They receive this grace. They receive this upon themselves. And they now say, I've received the greatest gift I've ever known. I now have the deepest joy I've ever known. I now have everything that I could have ever dreamed. And because of that, because of this news, it's so great. I've got to tell everyone. right? This is why we proclaim the news of the gospel. We tell people because they need to know this. This is going to change the way they live. It's going to change their lives. It's going to change the world. Oh, friends, what would it look like if everyone did that? They died to themselves and then sought to change the world. You ever notice how the missing link in social justice, when you see people saying, yeah, we're going to make the world a better place, is that they think they can actually do it without trusting in the one who actually will make it a better place. We chase God because he is God, and that's what the gospel is. And so look, verse 21 says this. Once you were alienated from God, whether you're alienated through rebellion or religion, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death present to be holy in your sight without blemish, without alienation. He lived the life that you should have lived as a physical human, And then he dies the death that you deserve as a vile, decrepit human who rebels, who flat out sucks, right? The gospel's kind of depressing when you think about it because it basically says you are not as good as you thought you were. In fact, you're terrible. But you are far more loved than you could ever imagine. Do you see that? So this alienation disappears, right? This alienation disappears psychologically, where within ourselves, we, we experience shame, we experience fear, fear, there's no more fear. There's no more shame. Physically, right, we live in a world that's full of sorrow, it's full of pain, physical decay, death. Yes, this world's like that, but when we trust in Christ, we receive this eternal life, eternal life with him. And socially, think about this from one another. What's the first thing that happens with Adam and Eve when they sit in the garden, right? They begin to like go against one another. No, you did it. No, you did it. And then we see Cain and Abel. They kill each other. Socially, the world just begins to fall apart. There's blame shifting, but the relationship's restored when we trust in Christ. Socially, it's it's a fixed. The alienation goes away. Here's the point. There's only one way that's going to fix our horizontal, vertical relationship with God and a horizontal relationship with one another. And that's, that's through trusting in Jesus. Okay, that's the, is the only way. Andy always says this, and I make fun of him for it, but it's so true, right? It's all about we've got to be in a vertical relationship with God. We have to be, and that's going to actually fix the horizontal relationship that we have with one another. And you just get to trust. The only way that, that you receive this is not by trying to work in it, but by saying, looking at really, and again, saying, I'm prideful and I suck, but I trust in him for that. And then you receive this. Then you receive it, and you're no longer alienated. And you no longer need to try and do it on your own, like religion would say. There is one thing here, though, verse 23. It says, if you continue your faith established and firm, Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you've heard and that has been proclaimed to you and to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. But notice the first bit. If you continue. It's not a one-time transaction and you're in. It doesn't work like that. You must continue to follow. 
You must continue not to rebel. You, and you better make sure that you continue not to turn this back into a religion. Where you say, I have to just keep, you know, oh, that, that, what it means to, to continue is I got to keep doing these good works, keep doing these good works. No, no, no. That's a good thing. But you trust in the good work of Christ. And out of gratitude, now you do works. Because how could I not? How could I not do this now that, that I've received this incredible gift? That's the kind of perseverance that it talks about. It talks about being involved, engaged with one another in a Christian community, in a church, local church. It doesn't have to be at Northview. It can be wherever you go, where you can have somewhere you can have a vertical relationship with God and, ver- and horizontal with one another. And so, again, though, this, this verse, if you continue your faith, it, it causes us to question ourselves. Are you willing to accept the consequences of your rebellion? Are you willing to accept those consequences if you turn to rebellion, if you turn to religion? Are you willing to stand before the king who holds all and answer for your rebellion? Or the other question, are you willing to turn from rebellion? Or do you like the darkness? Or do you like to pretend that you have the light, but you really like the darkness? Are you okay with the consequences of that? Where this eternal life actually will be eternal death? And it will be eternal. Where's the darkness too sweet to you? What's it going to be? The only way that you're going to be there in the end, look, is if you receive this gift, the sweetness of this gift, and you enjoy it, and you know it, and it, and it moves every piece of you to action. But if you're just trying to get there on your own, if you're just rebelling, you won't be there in the end. And every religion is going to say, yeah, you will. We love to say, of course you'll be there. Or even preachers will tell you, yeah, you'll be there. God loves everyone. But it's not going to happen like that. You must continue. The mark of a Christian life, I think, was said best by Martin Luther. He says, all life is repentance. So here's the question. Are you going to repent of your rebellion? Are you going to repent of your religion? At all times, we might slide back into these. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that we are never, like we're not going to be perfect. Jesus was perfect. But when we realize that we're sliding back into either one of these categories, what's our response? Do we come in repentance? The mark of a true Christian is a life of repentance. Do you turn back to the one who will give you grace eternal? Or do you try and do it on your own? Or do you just say, screw it? Will your life be a life of repentance? When you stand before him, will he see, you know, because that, that conversation is going to be interesting, right? He's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? Well, you can say, I did a lot of good things. He says, yeah, sure you did a lot of good things, but you did like a ton of bad things. No, what we're going to say is we're going to go up to his face. We're going to say, look, I plead the blood of Christ. I'm a, I'm a useless uh, idiot like all my time spent here on earth. But I plead the blood of Christ. And that's what you're going to need to do. Is you're going to need to plead the blood of Christ and have a life of repentance that continues to show people that you come back to this, uh, to this person of Jesus who was so precious and so good to us. Turn to this third way, which is Jesus. That is my call to you today. If you haven't, if you're walking a life of rebellion, you're walking a life of religion, would you turn back to this third way? It's Jesus. It always has been and always will be. Would you turn to him? Would you come out of the darkness? Would you turn to the light? Turn your gaze to the light. As John 1 says it, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Come back to the light. Let me pray for us. Father, I um, pray that these words would uh, sink deep into us and that we would uh, we'd know your goodness and we'd turn to you out of desperation. Lord, we can't do this on our own. Thank you for coming as a, a physical person. Thank you that we can now know you. Lord, thank you that you rose again defeating death, defeating religion. 
Lord, may we be with you again in paradise, Father, and may our lives be lives of repentance. And now as we, as we worship you, Lord, out of gratitude of what you've done, may our lives show how thankful we truly are for your grace. We love you and we praise your name. And everybody said, amen.